All right, welcome to the one within all. Back to another episode of Interverse. Man, we've got a lot on our plate today with an excellent guy named Tom Barnett. I first heard about what Tom does and heard him speak on, I think, Crow Triple Sevens podcast. Man, I bring that show up a lot, but there's many good things going on uh, out there that I want more people to know about. And some of the things that Tom's got to offer uh, they are just incredible and definitely some of the most important solutions to our current problems in consciousness and health and thinking and society and <laughs> ourselves and getting back to reality, which is our true nature. So you can find what Tom does at globalbiodynamics.com. And uh, there's a lot of great information, blogs that Tom posts and uh, just seeing the and just hearing from him today about the, the way that he approaches integrating different aspects of our health, mind, body, and spirit is going to hopefully prove out to uh, anyone that was wondering just why certain things that maybe you hadn't thought were necessary to change yet or get into yet uh, might be the very important next step for you to get that next little bit of energy that can push you over to the edge into another phase of your unfolding. So check out Tom on the internet there. Uh, there's going to be links in the show notes to everything we talk about. And yeah, let's go ahead and hop right into it. Uh, Tom, <laughs> welcome to Interverse, man. Yeah, thanks, man. It's good to be here. So there's a lot of places we could go for uh, kicking things off. But I, what you do is very interesting. As a, a sort of coach, you combine movement, breathing, nutrition, thinking, feeling, and rest. And it might be good to touch on most or all of those uh, at some point as we go forward. But yeah. I'm curious kind of to know more about you personally, uh, where where you've come from. I know you've done some things that other people might think are crazy or impossible, like living without money. So uh, I'm just hoping to to get to know you a little better and find out some of the amazing things that are possible if we just like let go of our attachment to old systems and old patterns mm -hmm. yeah well that's the thing isn't it it's just letting go of the um it's we just run a paradigm really we run like a program through our mind that has been put there it's not the only program we can run but it's the one that we've been given and most people just take it on as as the um as the you know the default system whereas for me i've always seen that it's just not it just doesn't work so even from when i was a kid i'd, I'd be pushing the envelope a lot and um pissing people off in the process but at the same time it taught me a lot about myself and the possibilities and what we can do if we just if we change the way that we perceive ourselves in the world around us we can really change the way uh, we operate um sometimes that comes at a detriment to ourself either um, from health or from uh, from other other things, uh, which we can get into. But yeah, look, it's um, everything comes with its positives and negatives, and um, pushing the envelope like that is is no different. But um, for me, it's had a lot of rewards for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> yeah, we just have a lot of overlapping interests. I, I've heard you speak about common law stuff that you're getting into that's probably a brand new subject for people um i'm somewhat familiar with biodynamics i know that's something that uh, you talk about a lot biodynamics is, is a very interesting rudolf steiner uh, originated maybe or at least he popularized it way of looking at farming and food production and um much more holistic and eco <laughs> eco ecologically harmonious way so yeah. we, we can get into that stuff soon, but I'm feeling right now what I think we need to talk about is this combination of movement, breathing, nutrition, thinking, feeling, and rest. And the first thing that is on my mind uh, is that I wonder what's the maybe first one of the things in that list that will help uh, somebody get to, you know, item number two on the list, or is it just depending on the individual where, where they're at, where you would start them yeah. out? Yeah, always the individual. I think um, to start with, if somebody's just doesn't have anywhere to start, I'd say it's the breathing. I'd say it's it's getting to know the breath because that really can tell you a lot more about the physical body, the feeling and the thinking. They all relate to the breath. So um, I think that's a good place to start. I think most people are a bit disassociated with their breath. Um, one of the questions I like to ask myself and for other people to ask themselves when they get into any 
kind of situation they can't handle or they've just got they're caught up in something with inside themselves a good question to ask is where am i right now and where's my breath and as soon as you come back to the breath it's quite hard to be anxious or uh, you know angry fearful like all the emotions or reactions that had a high um level to them they won't might not come to zero but they'll drop a lot when you just come back and you ask that question where's my breath and you find where it is and most of the time it'll be up here somewhere and then when you can find it and you know where's my breath where's my breath and you start to try to feel it lower and lower until it gets right to where it's supposed to be then you you automatically sync more your mind and body together therefore you're going to feel more and you're going to think more clearly so yeah for me it's the breath and we can never get too many reminders. Uh, just the way you described it right there. I was like, oh, man, my breath is way up in my throat. <laughs> and I just kind of started bringing it down. And I'm going to focus on that as we go forward, as a good podcast host should do. Just keep breathing. And yeah. what I think is interesting about that list, too, is how they really all overlap. Like yep. breathing is also a rest, like just getting into your breath in any of those other activities any type of activity is actually probably going to bring more restfulness to the situation. And so I guess where I'm getting with that is that rest is obviously not just about sleep. I think most of us know how to pass out, although we might struggle to get there. Um, you know, I think a lot of us are, are very burned out with various aspects of our life. So like what, what is, uh, what are some key components of rest beyond just like the, you know, passing out and going unconscious part <laughs> yeah for sure yeah so well you basically got active and passive rest so um passive or active no sorry passive rest is when you're kind of just um you know you're just doing something that you feel is relaxing you're watching tv or you're um you know you're just being fed something where you're kind of switched not off but down and you're just allowing things to come in then the other type is when you you're really actively doing it your eyes are closed and you're a lot more aware of yourself as you are resting um, they both got their place, but a lot of people never get into the, the type of rest where they're actively really resting. And so that's things like um, meditation, Tai Chi and Qi Gong, or just broadly speaking, working in. And we'll talk about working in, actually, because that's really important to balance out uh, working out with the movement. But um, it's just doing something that's very actively slowing down your your mind, your thoughts and your uh, physiology so that you are resting. So when we at least have our eyes closed, we're in a far uh, closer state to sleeping than we are if we have our eyes open because we're getting a lot of sensory information coming in through the eyes. So sitting and watching some trees and some birds, that's one thing. If you're watching a screen, you don't know how much light energy and information is coming at you in various forms. So you don't actually know how much of your brain and therefore nervous system is being uh, just uh, triggered a certain way. So it might not actually be relaxing at all. You might think, oh, good, I've just like got my weight off my feet and I'm watching YouTube or the TV or something like that. But you don't really know what you're receiving because all light is coded with information and you don't know what that information is that's coded into the light. So that bypasses all of our rationale and it goes straight into the unconscious. So then that's why it's easy to program people through the medium of screen, for example. Uh, so, you know, you don't know what the flicker rate or the frame rate that they've used or anything that's happening that might actually be making your nervous system oscillate quite wildly, even though you're like, oh, good, I'm glad I'm just sitting in front of a TV with a beer or something like that. So um, there, there's lots of different kinds of rest. And I really recommend that if people aren't rested enough, which is most people in this day and age, we just have a crazy world that we live in. Unless you're really unplugged from that world, your nervous system most often is in sympathetic dominant state. That means fight or flight. The opposite and the nervous system state that you want to be in that we're meant to be in most of this time is the parasympathetic state, which is rest, digest, relax, create. So that's why a lot of people just have digestive issues. They have anxiety. They don't get to sleep well. They don't get enough sleep. They don't get restful quality sleep. They also don't have restful thoughts. They don't have um, contentment through their daily life and their relationships. It all comes down to having not enough rest. And, uh, and then there's the whole thing as part of that, that is the inability for some people to switch off because they feel oh, I should be doing something. I can't just sit. No, I don't have 10 or 15 minutes to spare. I've got to, I've got to do that. And there's an old expression actually that if you don't, if somebody doesn't have time to meditate for 20 minutes a day, then they should meditate for an hour a day. 
just to kind of put into perspective the importance of having time to actually switch off and do it consciously so that you're really rejuvenating the body because the body only rejuvenates when we rest. So that's why it's super important. I think the way that I have come to understand how meditation helps us and and it can be so simple or, or even rest, like just closing your eyes, even if you're not going to actually fall asleep. I mean, if you're laying there anyway, it can be pretty easy to at least take a few conscious, purposeful breaths. But <laughs> like you said, it's not rest to look at a, a screen just getting your weight off your feet. I mean, the blue light coming through the screens is that itself is triggering. We know like wakefulness state i mean I'm, I'm wearing these blue light filtering glasses right now i mean I, I i make videos and put them out i don't know what is encoded in the photons that are coming out of the screen at people that uh, would watch my video so it's <laughs> we were we were so in our infancy with uh, our relationship to this technology and it's never really going to be very easy to make it completely fit our biology since this doesn't exist in nature where we're from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what I found about this time thing is like when you feel constantly stuck in the rat race, running on the hamster wheel, looping through the same weekend, week out, weekend, <laughs> you're weakened by your weekdays. I find that, that it's like everything is just crunched together with with no space. It's like uh, it's like music that doesn't respect silence and the the pause between notes, and yeah. it all just becomes this overbearing, overstimulating, chaotic, stressful thing. But getting out of it, even just closing your eyes, spending that time, it's like putting in gaps in the in the song of your life. And in an interesting way, it feels like you're making time in a strange way. It's like you're adding, you're, you're taking ownership of your own spiritual currency, which is your attention. And I mean, maybe that's part of what you mean by working in, but when you get a good rhythm and habit of this, this expanding within that you can do meditatively, it, I, it's, you know, something that's not objectively provable, but it feels like you have more time to do everything else. It's a, a bizarre paradox that actually you feel like you've got plenty of time whenever you're not so anxious about that yeah. Kronos thing that you feel like you can't even take a minute to breathe. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, um, it creates space and then that space is there. It's, it's kind of, uh, it's limitless. You can actually spend your entire time in that state <laughs> if you, if you want to, but, uh, yeah, look, it's everything that we do, we create for ourselves. So if we're overly busy, we've created being overly busy. It's got to do with the way that we're programmed. There's, there's going to be a lot of um, unworthiness for having free time. Um, you know, a lot of people drive themselves a lot and it's because they're unsettled on the inside. So they create excess things to do on the outside. So their time is always, they're always time poor and sometimes energy poor. But they're creating that. We, we create everything that we do. The opposite of that is being very apathetic and lazy. So it's good to be driven in some respects, but you've got to know where it's coming from. So quite often when people are highly driven to become the best at something, as an athlete, a musician, a businessman, a woman, or anything like that, it's coming from a place of unrest. So therefore, they never actually find fulfillment in attainment. doesn't matter if they win world championships or play to 100,000 people on stage or make a billion dollars, it kind of doesn't matter because they're always unfulfilled because that uh, end point is just the extrapolation or the projection of a very, very unsettled inner uh, part of the being. So quite often when people rectify that and they find and pa and not pacify, but they've, they come to terms with why they were doing these things and they heal what it was that was projecting, then they no longer have that need to work 80 hour weeks or to... Um, you know, to have whatever it was, accolades or anything they were going after because they're actually just content then uh, as they are. And that's a real product of our societal uh, model that we have. So it really is a choice. I, th I don't think people realize that. A lot of people go along like they're just this passenger and they're at the whim and they're, they're, they're at the mercy of the elements or society, but, but we're not. You can blame that, it, but it's our choice. It absolutely is the, the story we create for ourselves and we create the reality that's around us that but uh, with no exceptions doesn't matter how good or bad you think your life is we're creating it all 
<laughs> on a lot of different levels for sure uh the ultimate i think reward of what you're describing is getting out of doing anything because you feel like you must and you have to like you're a slave to it or that something bad will happen if you don't and getting into doing things because they feel good to do because it's what you want to do and then you're creating from a place of wholeness and then originality is going to be more accessible because wholeness is your origin <laughs> that is yeah. literally originality <laughs> and individuality individuality is not being divided so you're you're chopping your life up into these parts of a clock i mean all of us are doing it to some degree kind of forced to by society but an example i'd also give is something that i experienced because i you know i started creating this show from a place of unrest to be honest or i, I developed some unrest over it early on where um i would spend time doing things that really weren't necessary just to give myself the need to be busy or like if, if, they, if that makes sense what what i would do is i'd go through and edit the audio for the show and find every like long gap or uh <laughs> loud breath or when someone said um and i just delete all those out and go through the whole like two hours and it, it struck me and eventually that was really burning me out of course because it's like so ridiculous and i realized it's like it's like this weird procrastination masquerading as perfectionism yeah. And I think we do that in a lot of areas of life. We put energy into details that really aren't going to affect anything just so that we can like get out of do doing what we really should be doing. That it's a bizarre aspect of the human condition, isn't it? How we've kind of gotten ourselves into a programming of what would be good for us. We think doesn't feel good and what would be bad for us. We think would feel good. We have it definitely got it backwards. <laughs> Yeah, and it's an avoidance mechanism, you know. The uh, overworking, over over perfectionism is a, is an avoidance mechanism most of the time. You know, actually, there's an app that does what you're spending all that work doing, takes out arms and takes out pauses for podcasters. Uh, well, I'll have to get a link from you for that or or, or something because that's pretty cool. I'll check yeah. it out for sure. I mean, at, at the end of the day, I, it occurred to me that like I don't care whenever it's not perfectly edited when I listen to a show, it's the conversation yeah. that matters. And I mean, most of the people I talk to aren't really using a lot of verbal crutches anyway, because we do this all the time. This is what we do. We get into the flow state and, and converse. We really communicate. I think <laughs> that's why this stuff is so important. Like what we're doing here, because in the external world, there's so much contradiction, like, two sides that don't hear each other they just negate one another through opposing language which is really like propping up this a wall where both people are leaning on the wall and the wall will never come down because there's equal force pushing on it I mean, that's how i see like i mean we just went through this ridiculous uh election circus of course which i'm sure you can't avoid hearing about and i think that's the perfect example of what i mean with this contradiction and we we do that internally too, I think, in, in different ways where uh, we rationalize or justify X, Y, or Z when we know in our conscience that that wouldn't have been the right thing to do for ourselves. And I mean, <laughs> even, I don't know, we're, we're never, you never do anything in, in a vacuum or alone. You always know what you did. So there's no getting away with, with anything. And I personally am trying to stop that mentality of oh i can get away with this i can cheat on that when it comes to everything from food to you know workouts try not to skip workouts anymore and all that yeah but, absolutely you got to be you got to be onto it you got to be onto it all the time and you got to be on because if you're not you're doing that passenger thing you know if you're not really creating actively what you're what you want with your life you're essentially the passenger yeah, I think I think absolutely that's true. It's um what I've come to express as being sort of spiritually dead. The spirit is the thing that's like animating your mind or like directing your mind and your mind is what directs your body. So you're taking out one third of your trinity whenever you get into deep levels of apathy because the animating force in, in my opinion the best way to metaphorize it would be care it's like what you care about is going to happen and what you are apathetic about you're definitely not going to do so we do have i guess like the best move is to try to shift towards 
you know, doing whatever you are doing because you care about it and trying to get out of all the things that we are doing because we feel like we have to, to go back to that dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, and avoiding that whole judgment of it's right or wrong because most of the time we're wrong anyway. You know, that's it takes a long time before you get to a stage where you can actually discern uh, some kind of universal truth from just a belief or uh, you know whatever. But it's important to still, if you if you know you're not causing harm or loss, it's just important to to you know make some mistakes and learn through the experiences that you you want to have. And I think a lot of people have that issue where they don't start things or don't do things or don't want to start creating something because they're worried that it's going to be wrong. It's going to be the wrong thing or they'll be wrong. Uh, but I think you really got to let that go because at the end of the day, 90% of what you think right now is probably wrong anyway. So don't worry about it. You're already wrong. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> yeah, if, if anyone's ever gone back to the earliest episodes of this show that I've left online, you'd be like, this is the same show. Like, uh, I had no idea. I, I was wrong about everything when I first started. I had no idea who who or what my direction was or like any of that. And just doing the thing anyway, the creation itself is what taught me. Just sort of like a parent would say that they learned as much or more from their child as, you know, that ch they taught their child. And Definitely. Uh, I, I bet you've worked with some pretty, uh, you know, successful, I would say, you know, that's a loaded term, but people who've actually been very passionate in pursuing their goals in life and to the point where they take it so seriously that they want to hire someone like you to help them out. And uh, so <laughs> I think that's, I think that's really interesting. I was just reading on your bio, all the different varieties of people that you have coached throughout, you know, your, your career uh, <laughs> in all these different fields, even royalty. So I think that's really, really interesting. It seems like you've uh, been, it, living an interesting life for sure yeah well i'll tell you one thing everyone's everyone's always the same it doesn't matter if they're they've got some royal role or if they're a ceo or if they're like a celebrity or if they're a mum down the road everyone's the same all the issues are the same all the fears are the same they're all the same everyone's the same <laughs> that's a great realization i think um, probably makes your job easier you you just found out what it is that that our being requires to continue being and to point people in that direction and uh, hope for the best that they start doing it for themselves. Uh, so yeah. to shift gears a little bit, I want to talk about biodynamics. It's something that I'm, I, I've am i dabbled in reading about, but I, I'd love to have you explain this to us so that maybe someone could go, wow, that's exactly what I've been looking for. I'm going to go start researching that. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, I only found out about it from Paul Check, who's who's he's who I learned a lot of things from with regards to you know health, the mind, the body, the soul, all that sort of stuff, and the holistic aspect how it all ties together. And one of Paul's influences was uh, Rudolf Steiner, so I wanted to look more into Rudolf Steiner. Also, because I knew parents at the time who sent their kids to Steiner schools, which is a a um, alternative educational schooling uh, system for you know for like little kids from first grade up to 10th grade i think they do 12th now but it used to be that you'd go to a steiner school till 10th grade then you did 11 and 12th grade at a standard school because they couldn't graduate you from a high school i think they can now but yeah one of those uh, aspects that i liked about rudolf steiner was first of all that he was not into the germ theory and he was more into the terrain aspect where you know the common sense side of things that if germs were so deadly, we'd all be dead. We wouldn't have got past day day seven of our existence. <laughs> and um, biodynamics, which we, which is essentially harmonizing an ecosystem and growing uh, in sync with nature's cycles, specifically with things like the moon phase, um, very very seasonally, and um, and to do with some uh, astrology as well. So uh, standard farming is, well, standard organic farming is where you, you're basically just doing it without chemicals. So you're doing it nature's way, but biodynamics just takes it a level further where you're really paying a lot of attention to the cycles of nature and all cycles of nature. And um, so for me, that's the ideal way. Well, it's just going to give you the highest energetic property in a yield in, from a food if you're doing it that way. Um, bearing in mind that, what grows in nature from a wild sense is going to be superior to what we do 
uh, all of the time. But at the same, but from our point of view, from when we've started practicing agriculture, I think, in my opinion, biodynamics is the uh, the cream of the crop as a way to grow food. Right, and it's not even a, a new idea, right? Like the old farmer's almanac would tell you the moon phases and things and it was just kind of folk knowledge i think that's where we've gone wrong is we've outsourced all of our folk knowledge yeah. and abilities to corporations who sell us back a, a worse version of it yeah, totally <laughs> but yeah so beyond well like oh, you were saying you know there's nothing new under the sun and it is old stuff and I, i'm not sure i don't remember ever reading rudolph say that it was his method but um i don't think he claimed it was you might have <laughs> i don't know but you, I'm you sure he said, came up with some good twists on it. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. But yeah, it's nothing new. I was wondering though, beyond agriculture, do you uh, do you often apply where the sky clock is configured to planning out activities, or do you just yeah. kind of you do actually? Yeah. Can you give yeah. us an example of that? Like, what might be a good uh, a good way to apply you know our astrological awareness to something that we would want yeah. to do? Yeah, for me, it's my energy expenditure. So that's with things like physical activity and also uh, sexual activity as well. So both for me go in line with the sky clock. So there's always a, like people think, oh, women have periods and men don't, but men do. If, you, if you're if uh, you tuned into your body, you'll notice when you've got your cycle, your own cycle, which is a libido cycle, but also an energy cycle and an emotional cycle. And it ties in with the lunar phases as well. Uh, much the same as women do. It's just not as um, obvious, I would say, but it's still there. You can definitely feel it. So uh, when, so that really determines if I do. I haven't been doing any like heavy weightlifting or anything for a while, but um, when I'm when I'm doing that sort of activity, then the heavy, the like the loading week will be when I'm in that peak week, essentially. Then there'll be the time where it's uh, time to be a bit more like a a regressed seedling before it sprouts. And then that's when things will be more a deload week or a rest week and um, so on and so forth. And same with sexual activity. So it's like that whole thing of being on heat and all that kind of stuff that doesn't just apply to females. It does apply to men as well. Like we're kind of like good to go any day of the week, you know, we can impregnate anyone any, any day of the week, but there are also within that, uh, within that ability, there are um, peaks and troughs as well. So the peaks uh, usually coincide with the lunar activity as well. And it will also coincide with that peak week if you're doing heavy lifting or something to that effect. So it's a hormonal thing and it's a, an energetic thing as well. So in the sense of getting to know your own cycle for a male, for example, that's not necessarily going to be that you're always at a certain point in the cycle when the moon's at a certain point, right? Like we're all... Well, you will be in that cycle for yourself, but we're not all necessarily in the same part of our own individual. Not necessarily, no. Progression. No, it, it does kind of pretty much correlate to full moon and new moon and that sort of stuff. But at the same time, we've got a lot of differences as well. And um, so it's not just sexual activity. It's it's the, uh, it's, you know, like whether you hold onto your fluids or not, that sort of thing. So there's times of the month where it's better to hold to your fluids and there's times where it's okay to uh, ejaculate and all that sort of stuff. Not that it's not okay at any time, but I just mean energetically there's better times to hold on and, and to not hold on and things like that. So for uh, it's like the moon, the lunar cycles are a pretty good guide to that. But like you just said, it, there are a lot of uh, uh, individual synchronicities within that and how your body is, you have to get to know. It's not like you can really read like a book on it kind of thing and then just start charting your, your ovulation and your whatever like women can um you will you can start kind of charting your own um cycles for sure but it's just you're gonna have to you have to feel them to chart them do you know what i mean it's not just going off a flow chart where day day 14 of the month is this for me and day 21 is this <laughs> yeah so there could be some variation as you go this yeah. is really interesting to me i uh, for the last couple of months i've been lifting again and i'm noticing I mean, I'm not feeling burned out on it or anything, but I'm I'm noticing when I look back on this activity of lifting four or five days a week for a couple months at a time that some days it doesn't feel so much like I've got a lot of juice to actually push those weights around. And then other days I feel like I can do anything and it's not necessarily related to how heavy 
the workload had been that week. Like some weeks I can just, I'm just stronger. So I, I'm yeah. interested, like would I maybe benefit from like you're saying, um, starting to maybe journal out w how I feel week to week and get a better impression uh, looking at the moon yeah. phase too, get a better impression of my own cycle. That's kind of where I would begin and yeah. then maybe, maybe change up my routine so it's not all weights all the time and other things at different parts of the cycle and Definitely. maybe have even better results for strength gain than just kind of pushing the same uh, activity over and over again repetitively because yeah. that's kind of unnatural right it is yeah and that's what we do in the checks i mean i'm not qualified as a check practitioner i've done I've always done things my own way so when i learned the check system i learned from paul's materials but i hired uh the highest level you can get of check practitioner and just paid him his hourly rate and we would work together on things i learn a lot quicker and i think you get a lot more done doing it that way than going to a course where the first week is just introduce yourself to the person next to you and I'm like i'm not here to do that i'm here to learn <laughs> you know so uh, i do it my own way and i get to the i get right into it and i get into the meat of it straight away so yeah one of the things you do in the check system is you do uh, either uh, for a few days or for a week or for a month. You sh a month is great. I really recommend that people do that to journal for a month. And you have a diary that's set out, you know, Monday Monday to Friday and then weekend as well. And then the, you know, the 6 a.m., 7, 8, 9, 10, right down to the evening. And you actually chart how you're feeling. You chart what you eat. You chart what you did for the day, as in I woke up late. I woke up early. I only got four hours sleep. I got nine hours sleep. You know, I did a hard workout today. I ran a triathlon today. I couldn't exercise at all today. All those things you chart. Now, if you wanted to take a step further, what you would also do is line that up with a lunar calendar and you would chart up the top just for interest sake where the moon phase is across that month. And then what you can do is start making correlations between, okay, was my energy dip because I'd, I'd worked 15 hours yesterday on the computer and didn't do anything else? Is that why I'm feeling low today? Or is it because of where the moon is? You've got to look at correlations, physic like really tangible ones first. There's so many people, especially around where I live, that just go, oh, I'm feeling out of it today because Venus is over here and Mars is over there. So I'm not going to do any work today. I'm not doing it. I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to call in work and tell them I'm not coming in. They <laughs> get really entitled people around here. But they just, they're blaming it on the planets, but it's they stayed up till two in the morning winning to a girlfriend and they only ate a salad yesterday. It's like, that's why you're tired. It's not Saturn, you know? You're doing stuff that's out of sync with nature's cycles. That's why you're tired. So uh, I do recommend still charting the lunar cycle, but you really got to look at diet, exercise, lifestyle, thoughts before you're looking at the moon. Uh, the moon has a big effect, don't get me wrong, but too many people blame extraneous circumstances because you don't control the moon, but you do control what you do with your life. So people don't want to look at that because they want to shirk the responsibility and go straight to the moon. You know what I mean? So um, so what I'm saying is use it, but but it's not your crutch. So it'll just give you an idea of if and when the moon, as a man in particular, women, it's a lot easier because you can chart your cycles anyway. But for a man to figure out what part of a lunar cycle might be correlating with something else. So to answer your question, though, Chance, it's like you're, if you have days where you're definitely stronger than other days, that can have more just to do with your nervous system, your parasympathetic versus sympathetic dominant and your, the state of your adrenals. If your adrenals are burnt out, you're going to be weaker. And you burn your adrenals out because you become overstressed. You've done too much work, not enough rest, like we were talking about earlier. So that has a huge effect on your uh, ability to generate work and energy. And then the other thing is that um, your, you only increase strength. For example, if you're just talking about gym, you only increase gains when you rest. does not happen when you're working out. If you work out every day, you'll go backwards. You will not gain strength. You'll actually lose strength if you go Monday deadlifts, Tuesday squats, Wednesdays uh, bench press, Thursdays a, you know a full body circuit, Fridays back to squatting. You know Saturday you do a full body and you do an Olympic lifting, and then you, you're not going to get anywhere. You'll literally get weaker because you never rested. And it's only when the nervous, not just the muscles, but the nervous system gets to rest regenerate and strengthen that's when it because strength comes from the, the nervous system's ability to fire through a muscle not the muscle size or mass so it's um there's a lot of different things that go into training as to what you're training for and your goals therefore what your rest periods are and your in your periodization in your training cycle but um all of it comes down to are you resting enough if you're not then you're not going to get gains that's just as simple as that 
So to take that one step further, to explain what working in is, and this is what I learned from Paul, one of the biggest lessons, is that you have to balance out working out with working in. The reason being is that this day and age, we work more than we're supposed to. We have more commitments and responsibilities than we're supposed to. We do not rest as much as we're meant to and create as much as we're meant to. So for most, your body doesn't differentiate stress. So it doesn't matter if you feel mentally emotional stress or it's relationship or financial or you burnt yourself out doing too much running around. Your body doesn't know what type of stress it is. It just knows stress. So you essentially have a basket and you fill it up with all those different things I just mentioned. Now, if it's coming in from various places, you don't just have, well, my relationship stress is really low, but my money stress is really high. It doesn't matter. It's all stress. Once that stress basket fills up, you can't fit any more stress in without something going wrong. And going into the gym and working out hard, even though you enjoy it and it's good for you, if it's if you already have an overfilled stress basket, that's physical stress. Now you're just filling it up even more. The body won't handle that. So what we need to do for most people in this day and age is to balance working out with working in. So working out is when we go to a gym or we go running or we do push-ups at home. So what we do to work out is we expend our own energy in order to move something outside of ourselves. That something could be a weight, you know, a barbell. It could be your body through space as you sprint down a track. You're expending your own energy to move something outside of yourself. So the complementary opposite, like dreams to the waking state, is working in is the complementary opposite to working out. So instead of expending our own energy, we cultivate energy. And we, what we do with that energy is instead of using it to move something outside of ourselves, we use it to move things inside of ourselves. That could be blockages that are emotional or energetic or whatever. But essentially, we're doing the complete opposite and we're cultivating energy. Typical examples are Tai Chi and Qi Gong, not yoga, not um, anything that requires that I can either elevate a heart rate or a breathing rate. You can do working out on a full stomach. And what you should do is you should feel more energized after your working in session than when you started. When you work out, you'll end up feeling less energized at the end than when you started, but it still has its place because that's a relaxation. That's an expulsion. It's a, you know, if you're like, if you're like full of electricity, you just, you know, you earth it out. That's what working out can do. But if you're already overstressed, you need to work in as much as you work out. So how do you work in and what is it? All it is, and it's really important because it's going back to what we're talking about at the start with breath, it's literally syncing your breath with your movement. Now, when we move and breathe out of sync with each other, it creates stress within the internal system. Sitting and meditating is good, but it's static. We're not static beings. We need to, we, we move. It's like when we do core exercises, if we just do isolated core exercises like planks and never move our limbs, we might get strong at the plank, but our core might not know how to stabilize when our arms out here or our legs out here or we're in a split lunge or we're like pushing something overhead or catching something. That's all dynamic. If the core doesn't know how to stabilize that, then it's not functional. It's only functional in a laying down position, which is not a functional position. You know what I mean? So learning how to work in and sync the breath meditatively with the movement is helpful for everyday life because that's what we do. So meditation has its place, but working in, I think, is superior because it's meditative and it's teaching the body and the, the nerves, nervous system how to sync with the breath. So all it is, it's really simple, is when we respirate, when we breathe in, everything in the body opens up. We know that our lung, our rib cage opens up when we breathe in, but every bone, unless we've got fused bones because we've got osteoporosis or whatever, every bone moves as well. It might only be slightly, but they all move, like the, the tibia and the fibula move. The cranial bones move, they slide microscopically, but they move. When we breathe out, we know that our lungs and our rib cage close off, but so do all the bones in the body. They, they turn in. The whole body respirates, not just our lungs. So what happens is anytime we hold stress in the system, it stops that happening. So if we're holding on to something, it stops that natural respiration and movement happening, which is a stress. It's an internal stressor in the body. So what we want to do is learn how to sync completely the breath and the movement. So what it looks like is even if you're in a wheelchair and you can only turn your hands, it would look like this. You breathe in, we open up, then we breathe out and we close off. Now, the trick is your breath and movement has to stop and, 
at the same time. So when we breathe in, uh, my breath stopped at the end range of motion. My breath stopped at the end range of motion. My hands technically for the purpose of this demonstration don't go any further. So if I did this, see I've stopped breathing before my range of motion finish or this, I stop breathing, I keep going or I do this. And I'm still breathing out while my hands are stopped. Yeah, so that's the simple version. The, the main version is pushing or we squat. We do a full body squat. And as long as we're, we're opening up when we're breathing in and we're closing down when we breathe out, we can't do it wrong. We can literally perform any movement. It's limitless. It's, it's highly creative. So while Qi Gong and Tai Chi are great, they are very form-based, which means they're a little rigid. When you can learn to work in, you can literally do any movement that you can possibly allow your body to do. And it's not like thinking, I'll do this, I'll do that. It's just my arm might want to move here. I'll feel like doing a big squat. I'll feel like doing a deadlift. I'll feel like pushing up above. I'll feel like moving across. And most of it, you end up doing Qi Gong anyway. But the purpose of it is literally to get that sink of the body and the breast. So my favorite one for people to start with is just what I call a lung. And you basically just sit with your hands kind of like down around your waist and you breathe in and you just kind of like bring your arms out a little and then breathe out and bring them back in. Breathe in and breathe out because there's not much, you don't have to think. You're just like, I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. Usually your eyes are closed the whole way, breathing in, breathing out. Then once it becomes a real like, okay, I've just got the feel for this, then it can come become anything. Like you're really, your whole body's moving apart from each other. You're squatting, you're bending over, you're moving, or you're almost dancing, but you're not thinking, oh, am I breathing? Do I move my arm here? Because as soon as you bring thought in, you start to put rigidity in the system. You need to be quite loose. So it's a, something you can work out over time. It's a skill that you develop, but to start with, you don't need any skill at all. It's literally sink the body, and the movement, sorry, the breath and the movement. And then you might have to put some thought into it. Uh, hang on, am I? That question earlier, where's my breath? Where is my breath? Oh, wow, I stopped earlier. Where, where's my breath? Oh, that's it. You just feel it. You know, you just feel it. It comes together. So that's working in. And that should be done if you, if you feel you're having peaks and troughs in your energy and your strength. You need to up the amount of working in and maybe decrease the amount of working out to take a couple of steps back to take several steps forward because. You just won't make gains if your body is not recovering. That's the that's the basics of it. Uh, but I want to get big. <laughs> yeah. Just kidding. That's, like, <laughs> that's kind of like a lot of times the goal for working out for a lot of dudes. Yeah. And it's interesting how probably many don't even know that, like you said, strength is from the nervous system brain relationship to the muscle fiber and how well it communicates the message of, yeah tense release right and that's is that's the real important factor and man i actually needed to hear all of this stuff what you just said i i'm so grateful actually that this conversation is happening right now because i'm at a great point in my life to take a huge advantage of what you're talking about because i, I mean i already i already know some qigong and one great thing about the form formalism of qigong or tai chi is that you can, after you've done a lot of practice, yeah. take the thought out of the equation really easily because your body's like, I know how to do this. And very, very cool point what you made about sinking the breath and the movement, stopping at the end of the in breath and the out breath. I, I have actually, man, from a Qigong practice, been able to get to a flow state many times where it's no longer even conscious the the signal from the brain to the body that says move this way it's like i breathe in and yeah. the movement occurs and it's like the breath yeah. itself is what's pushing the body and that that feels amazing it's like <laughs> that this was also what unlocked the uh you know energy work as a, a capacity for me was getting into qigong this very thing because you're getting in touch with your internal energy what it feels like inside yourself but I'd never considered it to be working in. And an ex another example from my life, one of the best shape, uh, one of the best shapes I've ever been in. I was like rock climbing every other day yeah, and right. doing Qigong every other day, roughly. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but I never equated that that was actually like a balanced way to go about it. Um, I even was like in my mind, like, man, I should be doing other types of uh, working out. I'm not working out yeah. enough, but I was getting really good at climbing. And then later on, uh, I started only just climbing and going every other day or sometimes 
days back to back and uh, not doing the working in anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Laps on the Qigong and man, mm -hmm. I wound up with my shoulder being injured. That took, uh, it took me most of this year to get it back in yeah. like functionality, which turns out one thing that really helped me with that was a yeah. uh, tuning fork. Um, uh, Sonic slider by from Eileen Day McCusick at Biofield Tuning. It's like an on the body fork. Really, really helped me get the the pain down so that I could start working for mobility again and working it out. And but yeah, uh, Qigong it's such an amazing resource and Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. But now, like you said, we can develop our own system. One thing that's cool about Qigong is a lot of those moves are based on observing animals, which is which is pretty neat. We can kind of like imitate their form and their energy. And <laughs> there's so much to it that, you know, a good Qigong system is going to activate the the various meridians systematically, right? Like, mm -hmm. so there's some advantages to that. But like, in, like dancing, you could do it in a freestyle flowing way where you're letting your body tell you where it wants to move energy. And yeah. I, I think this is so important. I mean, it's important for me. I'm going to switch it up. And because again, I've just been working out and not working in very much at all. And uh, I'm going to. I'm going to take this to heart and add journaling to it. And <laughs> it's rare, yeah. Tom, it's rare that I talk to someone eat and actually I'm taking notes about like, this is how I'm going to modify my behavior after this conversation. It's, it's, <laughs> despite the fact that I talked to a lot of really intelligent people, like this is a very, this has been very helpful for me. So uh, I'm imagining it's helpful for the listeners. And we've talked about moon cycles and tracking that before, but it was kind of in the context of, uh, females you know it wasn't that we didn't talk about males being influenced by that but it's good to have this conversation with you uh and hopefully the guys out there are also like man yeah i haven't thought about these things this way before but to, to back up a little bit and of course if you have anything to comment on about what i just said start there but i wanted to talk about the uh the other element of our cycle that you mentioned which is our sexual energy because i, mean, I haven't talked about sexual things a lot on the show i mean not because i'm afraid of a taboo but it's just like we just don't talk about these things very much um in a healthy way anyway and yeah i think the concept you're referring to has to do with in chinese medicine the jing energy mm -hmm. and so i'd love to maybe expound on on that and how our our sexual energy affects the rest of our energy system why it's so important to maybe start thinking about whether or not we're gonna retain or release that <laughs> that seed material <laughs> yep for sure um well actually yeah i will just start with some what you were just talking about before because it leads into this uh what you're feeling when you if you breathe and your body moves itself that is literally the chi the life force within your body you're feeling that and the reason that it can move your body which it wants to all the time is that the mind's got out of the way the mind is what constricts our energy and uh, our connection all of the time so the force of creativity that created us, and it only knows how to create. It doesn't know it can't or it shouldn't or it'll suck if it does it or it's not worthy or anything like that. It only knows how to create. But what we do is, and we have that when we're a kid, when we're really little, but as we learn and we start doing coloring in or we start doing, no, 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 that's wrong, Chase. No, 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 that's wrong. That's bad. You went outside the lines. No, it's the wrong color. No, you're not good at that. Just You're just making a mess. Just don't do it. And it just like, whoosh, but that creativity just kind of like, oh, shit, it starts to think. So we learn the ego starts to develop and we learn right, wrong. We learn critical and we learn, um, we learn bad. So then this now becomes a tap and it turns off that force of creativity that only knows how to create and, and can only create. We turn it, we, we put a dam on it with our thoughts, thinking, judging and criticizing. And so as we move into adulthood, we tend to get a lot of constrictions within the body and that can be physical constrictions, blockages, tightness, stiffness, uh, propensities to injury, uh, propensity to anger and outbursts and things like that. So if we can start removing the thinking, judging, criticizing, we do start to allow that creative energy to flow. And that's, that's what chi or life or life force, prana, whatever you want to call that, that's what it is. And, um, and we can tap into that all of the time. Uh, well, when I say we can't tap into it all the time, you have to be a monk on a mountain to have it all the time, I think. But the majority of the time, we can always snap back into it when we're out of it. So the point of that is, um, or one more thing actually, is that when you're doing your breathing and you sink your body to the in and the out breath, there's that space 
at each point. The in, it stops, and particularly the out. Now, there's a point there where you stop and there's pure stillness. Before you take another breath, you're in pure, pure stillness there. And you can actually watch that stillness. And then you can, and then as you start to feel the need to breathe, because you can prolong it, you can just go, well, what is it? In, what is it that needs to breathe now? Like, what is it that's wanting to do that? And you can start to find really deep places in yourself and, and from where you come from and stuff in those spaces in between. They're really, really powerful places. So uh, moving that then into the sexual energy, you're right. It, it's something that not a lot of people talk about. And it, it, it's not good because as a holistic therapist, that's one of the things I talk about with a lot of people. Because if you're not, if you're not addressing the fundamental creative energy that is within a person, which is your sexual energy, it creates life. It's the most creative thing you can do is make a kid, you know, try making that with crayons or uh, a guitar, you know? Well, some people say guitars can lead to making babies, but it's, uh, it's, uh, the creative energy is the sexual energy. So we're muting that in today's society. You know, Catholics, have the highest incidences of cancer of the sex organs, testicular, ovarian, uterine cancer. Why? Well, they're one of the they're one of the cultures that have such stigmas around sex, sexual activity, and um, and certain feelings. When you mute nature's, when you mute nature, you put constrictions around it. You create a dam, and when you create dams, you you can create things like tumors and cancers. That's showing that you're going outside of nature's laws. And they're the most highly repressed in it from a sexual point of view. They have the highest incidences of cancer of the sex organs. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to correlate repression of sex and sexuality to cancer of the sex organs. That's really clear. So it's not something we should be muting and avoiding talking about. And that's why some people can go to many different therapists and sexuality is like an elephant in the room. Well, we don't talk about that. You know, those are private parts. <laughs> it's like... What you're missing a huge chunk. You're missing a, a huge chunk of who and what you are if you're not talking about that. So that chi, that life force, that prana, that's all enveloped within sexuality. So there's a lot of different uh, yin yang relationships within sexuality as well. There's being overly promiscuous is not healthy. Being completely celibate is not necessarily healthy. There's uh, there's always a balance, and it's always there's always like an intention, and there's a um, well, there's a lot to it, but there's an intention behind everything and that's key to what's healthy and what's not healthy. Uh, where do you want to kind of go with it or start with it? Well, uh, man, this actually just popped into my head, but what what can we say for people that are, that are celibate in the current phase mm -hmm. of their life, but maybe don't want to be? Um, what what can they do with their sexual energy in a healthy and constructive way? Like, obviously there's plenty of unhealthy outlets for that in today's age. And, you know, like sexuality is just on demand yeah. access anytime, which when you think about it, it doesn't really jive with nature in, you know, a technology less world. You would never have any kind of just instant gratification access to, you know, sexuality from another human being, especially mm -hmm. without money in the equation. Like if money didn't exist, it would just be something that only was an outgrowth of your natural relationship with other yeah. beings. So, you know, like <laughs> how, what kind of, what kind of ways can, what's it, are we sabotaging ourselves with this, uh, you know, pornography addicted oh, culture yeah. and with, yeah, porn yeah like, like, let's talk about that. Yeah. That's uh, definitely a, that's definitely an unpopular opinion in some, in, in our own minds, I think for some of us. No, it's just por porn's just uh, it's it's really not good. I, I don't like to make absolute absolute statements though, so I'll give you a little bit of around around around, and then we'll we can like hone in on something if you like. So uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, like eroticism as a form of art isn't necessarily inverse itself. No, by right. So but it's, this, so it's a little bit tricky. Yeah. So this is how things work. This is how the establishment really functions. They take something that's natural and they just bastardize it a little. It's like to take it away from its pure point. So porn, for example, it's not a new thing because uh, uh, culturally, like for native cultures and traditions and things, they would take kids from a relatively young age and let them watch people having sex. So they knew what to do. It takes the taboo away from it. It takes awkwardness away from it. And it's educational. 
So especially teens in that too, they would like, because what would happen is especially when they used to, uh, you know, kind of like match make and stuff. It's like a man had to know how to please a woman. If a man didn't know how to please a woman, he wasn't getting a woman. So you've got to learn that from somewhere. So they would actually literally take people in tents, young people and let them watch. It's like how they learn and to, to take, you know, it's, it's not, so that's technically porn, right? But then what the porn industry does is it's, it just, it, it takes a natural thing and it just, it just kind of bastardizes it to the point where it becomes, it gets into the psychology really deeply. And I know there's a lot of women that have told me, it. what's that, sir? Uh, it fetishizes, fetishizes it. I yeah, guess, it does. Yeah. Like yeah. And it takes, it takes connection away. And so a lot of women have told me that they, their guys just can't connect to them. They, they don't, they say, yeah, no, you're attractive, like you're beautiful, but they, they can't get turned on by them. Or they do, but it's like fleeting or it's not good or they don't know how to have sex properly and whatever. It's, there's it's this porn nature that's put into things and it's not natural in any way. Um, then you've got, uh, so the jing, which you were talking about before, that's like the creative energy. And there's a lot of things you can do with it with regards to holding on or ejaculating or whatever. We can get, get to that in a minute. But that energy, like I said, is a pure creative force. So when somebody goes, I'm just going to be celibate, to me, I just, I say, why? Because that's not a bad decision per se, but you might be running from something. You might be shutting yourself off to yourself and the world because of a core underlying issue, which you're not going to deal with if you just project it onto being celibate. And celibate, I don't know whether you mean celibate as in not having sex with people, but you're having self-pleasure because you're watching porn or you're just getting vibrators or whatever. But it's like there's different forms, I think, of there's of that when people talk about it. But um, that you got to remember that you're dealing with a creative energy. So if you were to have a period of self, you know, isolation from uh, sexual activity, there's nothing wrong with that because you can do that for spiritual reasons as long as you're not running from something. But what you can do is to not, in order to not mute that part of you, you just be creative. So you write music. You feel that you'd cultivate that. You could just do it meditating, right? And you can just get into your breath. Where's my breath? Find your breath. And then you can bring, you can start cultivating from your um, sexual organs. And you do that by drawing the energy up. You kind of pull up. It's like as if you're pulling, you know, they call it a, a mortar bund or whatever they call it in yoga. It's where you pull the sex organs all up into the body and it draws the uh, the energy up. In some, in uh, in uh, Indian culture, they call it the kundalini, um, jing, whatever you want to call it. It's just drawing the sexual energy up. So now it comes up into the body. Now you can do something with it. You can express it. You could dance. You could shake it out. You could get a pen and you could draw something. You could get, oh, sorry, pencil. You get a pen and you could write a poem. You could pick up a guitar and you could write a song. You know, you could do anything creative. You could use your hands and just build something, do some rock stacking, you know, build a new cabinet or something for your kitchen. It's just a creative energy. So if you're not, you're not muting that if you are transmuting it. I'm drawing the sexual energy up. Now I'm transmuting it into something creative. Then you're not muting it. But if you're just sex is wrong, sex is bad, I'm not going to have those feelings anymore, then yes, you absolutely are putting your mind in between you and God and what the force of creativity that has made you and still wants to make great things through you with your life and you're actually muting that and um, going against nature's laws. Um, Where do you want to go from there? Well, we're at the halfway point where I'm going to do a hard break and then you know, if you've got time for an hour or part of an hour for our yep. people that subscribe, that'll be awesome. We can pick yep. up on the other side because there's there's more meat on them bones, as they say. But in uh, the last bit of the first hour, let people know where they can find you and uh, how mm-hmm. they can work with you and any closing thoughts for, for that audience. And and then you have my thanks because this conversation, I mean, it's one of those that's just like, dang, we're already at the hour snapped by really fast because – uh, this is the kind of conversation I would want to go and hear somewhere. So it's very, for me, this is awesome. I hope everyone out there is, is uh, picking up some some good ideas too. And thank you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so um, I've got a new site that's, we're just, it's been in the process for a, well over a month, probably two months now, but we're just making sure the platform's safe before we launch it because we don't want it to be taken down. So we're currently just looking at a new platform and then it'll be up. So that's tombarnett.tv. And that's, uh, I'm going to stream from there and stuff. It'll still be free. It's just, there'll be, if you want to support, you can like subscribe on there. But the main part of it is that it's going to be safe because everyone's getting kicked off YouTube and Facebook at the moment. They're all getting accounts deleted. So, uh, 
I'm soon to be next. I don't know why I'm even still there because I was public enemy number one after that virus video. And um, so, yeah, that's what that's for, TomBarnett.tv. And uh, if people want to reach out and do, um, if they need any coaching, then they can email me. It's info at globalbiodynamics.com. Perfect. Yeah, people get on that at the very least. If you like what Tom has to say, then you'll find plenty more good conversations that he's had with other interviewers. Uh, yeah, you're very, very well spoken and this has been super helpful and we'll see members on the other side. Booyah, my friends, we got another one in the bag. That was a great conversation, man. Tom Barnett really paired nicely with the episode from a few days ago with Sonia Barrett. And yeah, I mean, it's also kind of funny that their names are almost the same. Barrett, Barnett. It's like the only difference is an N. But hey, that's kind of how things work around here. Synchronicity just decides how the flow is going to operate. I just follow my nose. <laughs> follow my nose like the K-N- OWS. And I knew for sure that Tom would be a great guy to talk to. Didn't know what it was going to be about exactly. That's kind of how I've been playing it lately. I used to be more controlling of the direction of episodes. And uh, yeah, lately it's just been more loose. I don't know if it's because I'm changing or I'm needing to have less stress in my life and just play it by ear a little bit more. But it also could be an experience thing. I mean, at this point, sitting down and talking to someone for two hours, it's kind of old hat. <laughs> I hope you all out there are having conversations like this in your own daily life. Um, I mean, that's why I make the shows, because I find it hard to go get these conversations in daily life, especially in 2020. <laughs> I saw a funny thing, uh, a post online that said, when COVID ends, you'll either be a monk, a hunk, a drunk, or a chunk. <laughs> I was well on my way to chunk, that's for sure. And I might not be a drunk, but I have other ad addictive vices that are definitely easier to fall into the more alone one is. But you got to just remind yourself the thing that I often fail to remind myself, but I know it to be true, which is that you're never alone. Alone and all one are the same thing because we all are. We all are all one, <laughs> which means that at the deepest level, we're kind of alone and that is like the deep abandonment trauma that's at the root of all other abandonment traumas, I think. Mark Passio calls it cosmic abandonment, which is that we, as a <clears throat> universal consciousness, we, as the source, as, as the all, that part of ourself that's, that is that, there is no other. So we have to get used to the, I, the idea that there is no other. And I, man, it's hard for me. <laughs> I don't know if it's where my Venus is in my chart or what, but I have like a strong need for another to put love into. And, you know, I have a, a good positive out, uh, outlook on myself and a lot of confidence, which means I don't always like that can mask me, uh, my own problems from me. Right. And like, I think I'm great. I love myself, but that doesn't mean I actually practice self love and self care. I like to put that out onto other people. And, um, I'm sure you can relate, but luckily I'm not a chunk. <laughs> I've been getting back into the gym and this conversation with Tom was really helpful for me to think about the, I mean, the way that getting stronger really works and the balance that's required. And cause I was ready to just, and I had been for a while, I was ready to just go start banging my head against the wall, all in hard as I can go, tons of workouts, like not a lot of rest days and you know, kind of the way they trained you to do it in, in high school sports. At least that's how they trained me to do it back then. And they never said a thing about working in, which I think was the probably highlight of this conversation for me, that entire idea. And lucky for me, I've already got a Qigong. Uh, I've got Qigong experience. I, I already know what working in is. I just didn't have that phrase for it. And I didn't think of it that way as being like the counterbalance to working out. Even though there's been times in my life where I did balance those two things well, and I had great results in the things I was pursuing at that time. So I'm ready to get back into it. Uh, I'm going to be honest. I have not done a good job with the journaling thing so far. I plan on it. Like, <laughs> maybe, maybe. But it, it, at the very least, I'm paying attention to the moon. I mean, I always am. But we'll see. One thing at a time, right? And there's a lot of changes we can make to get healthier. So if you want to hear the second hour of this conversation where me and Tom talk a lot more about how to survive 2020, what's 
going on and the tyranny side of things, like what the world's going to look like after this lifting of the veil apocalypse, what our place is going to be in it. And, you know, whether or not the rest of the humanity is going to wake up, what it means if they don't wake up. Uh, I mean, are we even woken up? We're still in the system, aren't we? I, like there's a lot of uh, waking up left to do for all of us. And, the deepest part of waking up is coming to terms with your own responsibility for yourself, but also the knowledge that you have the power to be responsible for yourself. That's why I have a Spider-Man tattoo. Hey, there it is. You can't, whatever. You can't see it in the video. By the way, there's videos of this podcast. If you get on YouTube or BitChute or brand new tube or even hell, Facebook video, I put them on there too, just in case I can get some people out of Facebook land to, to look at some positive content. But Anyway, that the Spider-Man tattoo I just referenced, I mean, I think we all saw the Tobey Maguire movie. We know what Uncle Ben says, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, I'm here to tell you that you are omnificent. That's not omnipotent, not all powerful, but omnificent as opposed to omnipotent. I've used this word a lot in the show before, but if it's a new word of the day for you, good. It means possessing all creative potential or ability. And we do have that because our imagination is completely unlimited. Even if we couldn't actually have the power to do something we imagine, we do have the power to imagine it. And that's the first step. And if it's the right thing, then the stuff will align. So we don't need the power to do it, that the opportunities will show up and and it won't be us doing it. It'll be the force that lives inside of us, that life force energy itself coming through to make the right thing happen at the right time. That synchronicity. I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to talk myself up here. I, I've been depressed, guys. Like, I know that doesn't sound like me. And it, it's not like I am depressed or I have depression. It's not like I identify with that. But like, I've been behaving in depressive ways. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. Now, I, I'm okay. Like, you know, if you want to send me a message and be like, hang in there, I love you. I, I'll take it. But this isn't, I'm not fishing for that. I'm just letting you know that, I mean, if you're having a hard time, other people are having a hard time. We still got to do what we got to do. We still got to live our life. We still got to unfold and evolve. And yeah, I'm, it's going to be an interesting winter. <laughs> anyway, the second hour, like I told you about a second ago, you can get it on patreon.com slash interverse. I mean, money is not going to make or break my happiness. But if I did get more money for this show, that would help me a lot. <laughs> And I'll keep working on myself. I know that I definitely don't feel depressed whenever I've had a really good workout. And uh, I mean, the root of all these things, the hard feelings that many of us have, especially for me anyway, it's attachment. It's expectation. It's projection. I, it's actually, it's a hell of a thing. You know, you, we, we talk often about projecting our shadow onto other people. And what that means and how we see the things about ourselves we want to ignore in other people, but it goes both ways. It's not just the flaws that we are carrying that we judge in ourselves that we don't like. So we like notice them in others and oh, I hate when people are like that. It's our virtues too. It's our love. It's our positive qualities. We project those on other people and go, they are that. I love them for that. But you are all that too. You're all that in the bag of potato chips, <laughs> bean chips. I was trying to think of something different. Bean chips. I like all kinds of chips. That's a whole different conversation. If you haven't had bean chips, go give it a shot. Great dose of fiber and uh, beans and protein in a chip form. Yeah, go do that if you're hungry. Okay, well, let's talk about other ways you can promote the show for me. Help me out. You can get on iTunes the podcast app, leave a review, five stars, help more people find the show that way. You can just drop the stars and get out. It takes 30 seconds. Or you could leave a written review, which I'll read on the show at some time in the future. I like to check those. They give me a little dopamine hit when there's new ones. <laughs> a lot better than the Facebook notifications, man. Those are nothing but a bummer these days. The dopamine's not even flowing. It's just like, blah, everything is horrible. But yeah. You know, back to that idea of you'll either be a monk, a hunk, a drunk, or a chunk. Do you get it, though? Do you get it? We have to get used to ourselves in a radical new way this year. And that is like what a monk does. 
And if we're taking care of ourselves, you're going to become a hunk or a babe or whatever you want to call it. But the drunk and the chunk side, those go hand in hand, you know, like you're going to let this adversity make you stronger or make you weaker. The adversity of this year, the adversity of anything in life, the adversarial things, things that are adversarial to your life. Well, this has been a hell of a ramble. I was supposed to be telling you about ways to help the show. Okay, get in there to the show notes, check the links, go to Tom's website, see what he's up to, go to Patreon, subscribe there. Five bucks a month. It's so easy. It's it's easy. Ah, I know you got five bucks to give to me and I'm giving to you. You're still here, aren't you? You've enjoyed to some extent what I'm doing. Yeah, uh, you can also get on the show notes and find a link to Secret Energy. There's a shop there with lots of cool metaphysical tools that and supplements and stuff like that. I recommend the Sheila Jit and the Internal Cleansing Kit. Those are both really good. They got great magne- magnesium. <clears throat> Blah. I got to get my throat cleared or something. I'm doing an interview later. I'm not telling you who it is, but you know him. He's been on before a while ago, a year ago. It's going to be fun. I'm going to talk about the Great Conjunction. Anyway, okay, so those are some ways you can help the show. There's probably other ways, like share it, you know, tell someone about it in real life. I don't mean share it on social media, but uh, follow me on Instagram. I do a lot there. I put some funny stories up. If you're on Instagram, at Interverse Podcast is where I'm at. Would love to see some new people follow me there, share some of my posts on their stories. That'd be cool. It's a great way to help new people find out about the podcast. Or just send me a DM. I'd love to hear from you. Like I said, tell me to hang in there and that you love me. (laughs) I love you too. If you just think it at me right now really hard, I'll accept that too. Ah, that feels nice. Thanks for thinking about how much you love me. And I'm going to, I'm going to bounce. I'm going to play this out with elliptical, with an O, elliptical by my own eyes, my buddy, Mike Martin, AKA my own eyes. I picked him this time around because I love his music. He's a friend. I use his music a lot in outros because it's always cool. And he's coming into my town to play a show this weekend. And I'm excited about that. Don't know what I'm going to do about the face diaper part because it's not a Halloween show like the last time I went to live music where I could kind of justify my face diaper as being part of my ninja costume. Yeah, maybe I'll just dress like a ninja even though it's Thanksgiving. Sounds reasonable. Got to do what you got to do in these strange days. But you guys have a great time living your life. And I love you a lot. I appreciate you listening. Support me if you can. You're supporting more of this in the world instead of, you know, $5 towards Starbucks or, or, or whatever it might be. I'm not judging you. I buy Starbucks sometimes too. All right. But I love you. Like I said, let's get out of here. Bye bye. Take care. Look up my own eyes in the show notes for this track. And uh, bye bye. Bye bye. Pow, 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 pow. I don't know how to end these things. <laughs> Man, I'm weird, but I still love myself. See ya.